All right, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I'm Brother James, and I welcome you once again to our study of the book of Revelation. We are in Revelation chapter number 2. These chapters, 2 and 3, contain seven letters to seven churches, which have application to each and every saved child of God today and each and every local church of God's people. And we have come to Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, the church at Ephesus uh, is the subject here, uh, Revelation 2 and verse number 3, writing to the Ephesians. And let's start at verse 1 for context. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. We've covered that material so far. Verse 3, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Let's just make one comment on that third verse, for his name's sake. There are many great preachers in the world. Uh, if what they are doing is for their own name's sake, it will come to nothing. If what they are doing is for the honor and glory of the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, then fruit will remain. There are many great churches in our world today if what they're doing is to build up their own name or to make a name for themselves, it'll be wood, hay, and stubble in the day when the Lord tries the works of men. Let's make sure that what we do, we do for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you know in heaven, there won't be anyone praising my name or your name? There might be a little of that down here in this world. You, you might get some glory along the way. I might pick up a little here and there from one or two people. But, but in heaven, round about that throne, everything that has breath will be praising the Lord. So uh, he commended them for what they did that was right. Their works were right. Their labor was right. Their patience was right. Their opposition to evil was right. Their uh, refusal to accept counterfeit apostolic ministry was right. Their uh, bearing the burden of the work and the opposition that comes with the Christian life. They, their patiently serving the Lord was wonderful. The fact that they didn't faint. They kept going and kept going. They, uh, they didn't uh, you know, serve for a while and then, then drop back and fall by the way. All of that they are commended by the Lord for having done that for His name's sake. Now, a sad shift. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, and here's the cause. This is the cause for which God has something against this church. Thou hast left thy first love. It doesn't say they lost their first love. That could be an act of mere neglect or carelessness. Rather, they left their first love. And that, that's an ominous word. It, it suggests a deliberate turning aside. What about this first love? It's the full, uncomplicated bliss of the newlywed. Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2, you know, you know that, in sickness or in health, but you're sure it'll all be health. For richer or for poorer, you're sure you've got to get richer. And for better or for worse, it, it, it's, it's only going to get better. Uh, but then things happen along the way. Look at these words, uh, Jeremiah 2, 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. And so, he, he compares the love that his people had for him in the Old Testament, Israel, for God the Father. In the New Testament, the Christian, for God the Son. 
but he, he says, you, you, you loved me like, like we had just spoken our vows and we were in our, our honeymoon time period there. And the Lord hasn't changed. If someone changed, it, it wasn't him. If, if someone has left that, that state of things, it wasn't God. The new couple knows little about each other compared to what years of working and walking together will bring, but there's no cloud between them. The joy, there's none greater. Nothing in the world more important to them than their union. All the knowledge in the world is not as valuable as, as this love. 1 Corinthians 13, a very famous, familiar portion of the Word of God, speaking of charity, says, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could mo remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing, nothing greater, nothing better than that fervent love relationship. Consider this passage uh, again regarding uh, the first love between God the Father and the nation of Israel. This one in Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16. And let's start at verse number 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I throughly washed away thy blood from thee and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin and I girded thee about with fine linen and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head." Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper in a kingdom, or into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through thy comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. What happens? 14 turns to 15, but thou didst trust in thine own beauty and playedst the harlot because of thy renown and pouredst out thy fornication on everyone that passed by, his it was. So this tremendous love turned to tremendous pain and sorrow on the part of the Lord and turned to horrific sin on the part of the children of Israel. And now we have in the New Testament, we have the Lord Jesus Christ saying to his church, you're still working, you're still laboring, you're still adhering to the, to the facts of the matter, but you've left off loving me. I wonder today, I, I, I suppose that if you're watching a man teaching the Bible, you have a great interest in the things of God and, and learning the truth of the Word of God, and for that I commend you. But let me ask you, those of you that have been saved for some years or many years, do you know more Bible than you did when you started out? That's good. Or have you done more work for God than Perhaps you ever thought you would. That's a good thing. Are you, are you faithful to your church, to your ministry, to your giving? Are, are you faithful to read your Bible each day? All of that's good. Do you love the Lord? Do you love Him like you did when He first redeemed you from all iniquity? Do you, uh, is your heart filled with that that fervent affection, that, that desire to be in the presence of your Lord, that delight in Him, has it ever been stronger? Has it ever been 
more keen? Has, has there ever been a fervency to your love that has slipped away? The Lord says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. God is in opposition to people who serve him without loving him. That's, that's quite a statement from the Holy Bible. Love is, it, it's an amazing thing when you think about it, that the Lord of glory values our love and that God himself feels loss when we do not give him all of our heart. You know, the Bible doesn't say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy strength and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. The Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and then soul, strength, mind. I'm afraid too many times that mind is still engaged, and that strength is still engaged, but the heart, oh, my friend, how's the heart? How's the heart? You know, it'd be a tough thing if you're a minister watching right now, a Sunday school teacher, a bus captain, a missionary, a mother, a father, if you're still doing the work that God's commanded you to do, but you've lost the heart for the Lord, oh, it's, it's going to make that task a very Difficult one indeed. Verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. From whence, not, not to where, but from whence is the instruction here. The Lord is not calling them to look down into the mess that they have made of their lives or, or to examine their, their lack of love, but to look to Him from whom all blessings flow. Don't look at where you are now. Look back at where you were. Don't justify a, a current condition of, of indifference or callousness but look, look where you, where you were when your heart burned within you with love for the Lord. It's only the, the returning to the font uh, that, that enables one to enjoy again the sweetness of that living water. Thou art fallen. God very curtly sums up man's failures. He, he, he doesn't candy coat them. He doesn't try to put them in the best light. He doesn't give us the, the benefit of the doubt. He knows my heart. He knows your heart. He knows my thoughts, your thoughts. He knows our ways. And he really does just lay it out there clear and plain. When Rehoboam came to the throne of Israel, he acted like the fool that he was. To humble him, God allowed the Egyptians to invade Judea and to carry away as spoil the golden shields that Solomon had provided for the temple guard. Rehoboam seemed unaffected by the loss. He simply made shields of brass instead. They looked like gold. They would shine in the sun. They would protect a man. But they weren't as good. They weren't as valuable. They weren't as precious. They weren't as sacred as the ones that the Lord had made in the days of the construction of the temple. Uh, you can read about that, 1 Kings 14, 25 to 27. This is what happened at Ephesus. They were still busy, but the enemy had made off with the gold of love. And they had chosen to make do with the brass of service instead. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. How, how interesting that that chapter on charity begins like this. Some of you are way ahead of me, aren't you? Now think about it. The gold shields gone. 
in their place shields of brass, put there by a careless man. 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. Maybe your extra energy is a cover for less love. Maybe your intensity in rooting out those false apostles is masking the fact that your heart's grown cold toward the Lord. I hope not. I'm not accusing. But let's examine ourselves. And if if my love is not what it once was, if your love is not what, it's, what it once was, what does the Lord say? Repent. That's Revelation 2.5. Remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. I, I know, I know, there are many ministers that ridicule repentance. There are many preachers and teachers that will not mention repentance. There are some who even lash out at those who would dare call on men to repent. I'd rather be in the company of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't say, I won't mention repentance. He said, repent. Jesus didn't say, beware those that preach repentance. He told his people to repent. The first failure was not in this church's testimony before the world, but in its secret relations with Christ. Let me tell you, brother, sister, inward departure always precedes outward failure. If you don't get the inside right, it's going to show on the outside. What did he warn them? He would come and remove their candlestick out of its place. There was a seven-branched, I'm sure you've seen the pictures of it, there was a a seven-branched candlestick in the uh, Tabernacle, Exodus 37, verse 17. The failure of Israel to maintain a testimony for God among the nations led to the removal of that candlestick to Babylon. 2 Chronicles 36, 17 through 21. There was was a literal candlestick, the the actual thing that held held the lights in the tabernacle, And the people got so far from God that God allowed their enemies to run in, capture them, carry them away into Babylon. And and in doing so, they took the candlestick, the light-holding apparatus from the tabernacle, the temple, and carried it away captive into Babylon. Ephesus, that city, is a mere desolation now a wasteland without an inhabitant. The great marketplace is gone and the wild beasts and brambles now inhabit the spot where the goddess Diana once received adoring worship from the frenzied mob. Piles of colossal ruins are all that remain of the temple wherein she was honored. And the gospel light, which shone so brightly, flickered and went out. There is no longer a candlestick in Ephesus. The cities of the United States, more so those of London and and the rest of England, they hold monuments, large buildings, some still standing, where thousands and thousands of souls once heard the gospel and came to know Christ as Savior and now no church at all, or now a church that bears no resemblance to Bible Christianity. What happened? What happened? The love, the love departed from the heart. Then the works became corrupt. Then God turned out the lights. Great churches that once preached with power, great churches where the hymns of the faith were sung with fervor, great churches where many bowed the knee and called on the Lord for salvation. Nothing left of them at all, only a memory. My friend, don't let that happen to your Christian life. Don't let that happen to your church. 
repent and do the first works. God warned them, except thou repent. The church at Ephesus was located in a city which was once the chief port of Asia Minor, as we said two lessons ago. Its harbor was much given a change because of its continual silting. What was water became land, and what was land became water. They didn't have the big equipment that we have today that can dredge out these, these uh, channels and these uh, waterways and, and keep them free for the big uh, ships to come and go. This shifting character of the city is reflected in the Lord's letter to the Ephesians church. Once so strong in its love for him, the church is seen by him as shifting away. And he warns them, stop, stop. Do what you did at the first. When you first uh, loved the Bible and couldn't wait to read it, when you first loved the church and couldn't wait to get there, when you first loved souls and couldn't wait to tell someone, when you, you first loved missions and couldn't wait to give, all of that was springing out of your heart. It wasn't forced upon you by law or decree or, or commandment or pressure. It was what you wanted to do because you loved the Lord. God says to this church and, and maybe to some of us today, you need to hurry and get back to that before the lights go out. Verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, that's going to confuse some people. You say, what's going to confuse them? This, this idea of Nicolaitans? Well, that, but more than that. <laughs> God hating. Before leaving Ephesus, the Apostle Paul warned of this error. Ephesians 20, and we'll read it in just a moment. In recording the matter, the Holy Spirit left us with the truest definition of this error. What, what is this matter of Nico or Nicolaitans? Listen to these words from Acts 20 and verse 30. Also of your own selves, not outsiders, not the ungodly, shall men arise. The trouble begins with the desire for an exalted position. Remember the devil? Speaking perverse things. And what could be more perverse than bidding men to submit to a man and not to Jesus Christ? To draw away disciples after them. Listen to the verse in its entirety. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? It is exalting some saved people to an elevated status above other saved people so that these clergymen rule over these laymen, and the laymen have to look up to or kiss the feet of the clergymen, and the clergymen look down upon as, as lesser citizens or lower class saints, those laymen. When saints get away from God in their heart, they naturally allow man to come in between themselves and him. The Hebrews of old asked Moses to stand between them and God, saying, Let not God speak to us. Such is ever the way with those who have a desire for the good things that God gives, but not for the giver himself. The principle of someone taking a place between the soul and God and the people standing at a distance is known today as the clergy ruling over the laity. It was known in Bible times as the doctrine of the Nikeo to rule, laetans the laity, the minister class ruling over the peasant class, if you will. Much blame for this condition lies with the church members as much so as with their authority figures. 
Long ago, Jeremiah lamented in Jeremiah 531, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. You couldn't find, in the New Testament, you couldn't find a priest demanding church members confess their sins to him. So why is it the largest body of people who claim to be Christians subject themselves to such a system of blackmail? They've lost their love for God. And when they lose their love for God, they allow a man to creep in or to rise up and take the place in their life that God would hold if, if they loved God enough to abide by his scriptures. Often when believers sit back and do not study God's word or take responsibility for maintaining a testimony for him, aggressive personalities take the headship of the church and, alas, often develop into spiritual dictators with the consent of their subjects. Heeding this warning, the Ephesian church was commended for hating the deeds of such men. They were warned in Acts 20, these men would rise up. They were praised by the Lord in Revelation 2 for putting those men right back in their place. Now, some have said that these uh, were the heretical followers of Nicholas of Antioch who was one of the seven chosen to wait on tables in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. There's no proof of this. I just mentioned it in case you come across it, but there, there's, there's no evidence to support that interpretation. All right. I've got a lot to say about God hating, but I think we'll wait to the next Se uh, session. So for now, let's just uh, say thank you for watching. We have many, many hours of recorded sermons and Bible studies, dozens and dozens of books available for you. All of them you can find at our website, jameswnox.org. Thank you for watching. Hope you'll be with us for the next installment of our study in Revelation chapter 2.